I'll, I'll start with the with the connection. Um, you know, I, I I tried to limit the documents. This was like I don't know one percent, two percent of the kind of stuff that's out there. Uh, but uh, I've written elsewhere, uh, and and uh, historians of Oun know that the militia was founded on the thirtieth of June by the Oun. They were recruited at. Uh, at uh, St. George's Cathedral and at, uh, at the plots there, at the, at the square. Uh, and um, on the 3rd of July, it's also known, and it's been known for a very long time, that the militia was put under the command of the uh, German Sicherheitsdienst, the uh, security service, basically to work with the Einsatzgruppe. And uh, uh, the best authority I can imagine that the militia was uh, with the Aun is that if you read the memoirs of uh, of uh, you like to read memoirs of old Ukrainians, you might read the memoirs of Yaroslav Stetsko on the 30th of June, and then he talks about how a few days later the Germans were going to uh, uh, not recognize Ukrainian statehood, and he says, "What forces did we have at our disposal? All we had was our militia." Okay, so, you know, it's all there. You can connect it very easily. In history, we don't do a forensic analysis of every document we use or no history would ever be written. Uh, as I said, the rules of law and the rules of history are really quite different. There was no Ukrainian auxiliary militia. There was a Ukrainian auxiliary police, and that was founded later. The militia was founded on the 30th. Actually, the first militia was founded, I believe, on the 25th or 27th of June uh, on the way to Lviv. Uh, and then that first militia that's founded, and again, this is a Stetsko, uh, a Stetsko finds, founds it. Uh, they found it in order to remove the Jews in a certain locality. Uh It's true, Ukrainian uh, militia did not do much of the execution. Uh, they occasionally killed people with shovels or would beat people to death, that kind of thing. But it's small numbers. Uh, usually what they did is they rounded up Jews for the, uh, for the uh, Germans to shoot uh, or to send to concentration camps. But that's later. The people who actually rounded up the Jews, we know, are the, are the militia. You know, people on the streets who came out, uh, uh, there was a, there, I've got two interesting reports from uh, Melnikite, who was in the view at that time. And these were given to me by Miron Momrek, who is an uh, archivist in Canada. And he found them not in the Soviet archive, but in the, uh, uh, in the National Archives of Canada, where former uh, uh, Melnikites had given some, uh, given some of their material. Well, one, there are two interesting reports. Uh, one says that the, the pogrom uh, which occurred, he considered the demonstration of Polish national uh, um, activity. So he considered that Poles were involved in the pogrom, mainly. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. And the second thing he said was that the militia was made up of diversante. And my friend Miron Momrek sent that to me in order to show me that it wasn't the Bandarites who were in the militia, but it was diversante. What he doesn't know is the Melnikites referred to the Bandarites as diversante at this time. That was their terminology for them. As to the people who took part in the pogrom, probably a mix of, of uh, Ukrainians and Poles. Although how many Poles would be out on the streets when the Ukrainian militia was out doing things, I don't know. But we have some because we have uh, Polish eyewitnesses who are obviously there on the scene. We don't, you know, no one took a census of who was there in the crowd uh, encouraging people on. Uh, first, I want to go back to the eyewitness testimony, too. These are not eyewitnesses in the court of law. What happened is right after the war, with the immense destruction of the Jewish population, the, not the Jewish Historical uh, uh, Institute, which now houses the papers, but the Central Jewish Historical Commission, I believe it was called, uh, just got as many stories as they could. And they did it in, in 44, 45, and they continued. However, they're not the only people who collected them. And uh, uh, Steven Spielberg collected a whole bunch as well in the, in the 70s through the early 90s. And uh, 
and they tell the same kinds of stories. So, and there are also published books from all over. There's even a book in Spanish from a woman who emigrated after the war to Spain, and she wrote it in a kind of Bolivio program. And it's all the same kind of thing. So I would say that um, Mr. Uh, Luzinski has the task of trying to figure out why do all these archives from all these different places show and indicate exactly the same thing. As to the coalition document, I only want to say is, well, then what's your explanation for that? Why, why is this guy uh, active in the pogroms and then very soon after in the militia and in a special, uh, a special uh, uh, investigative uh, department within the militia probably connected with the uh, Olin Security Service? You know, my task, I bring these all together. Mark Kotzelenix brought them all together. Uh, Grzegorz Rosalinski Liebe wrote a biography of Bandera where many things are cited. May I, may, I, may I add something to this? There was a, the Soviets established a special commission following World War II to deal with the crimes that were perpetrated in view oblast. They came down with a report. In that report, they even provided names of perps. There isn't a single O'un leader, nor is O'un on that list. Soviet prosecutor, procurator, Roman Rudenko, in 1946, submitted these findings to the Nuremberg Tribunal. These findings were a part of the Nuremberg record. Don't you think that had O'un been guilt or Bandera been guilty of war or Stichko, been guilty of war crimes. Don't you think that a friend of theirs, like Soviet procurator Roman Rudenko, would have insisted that they be charged and punished, or maybe not executed, but punished? There isn't a single reference to them. Now with all due respect to your scholarship, Professor, which, frankly speaking, I'm not impressed by. The seminal, the seminal work on the destruction of the European Jews was done in three editions and three volumes by Raoul Helberg. You quote him in defining what a pogrom was. There is no one better than Raoul Hilberg. There is no one more of an expert. In his entire three volumes, he mentions the OUN, the Organizatio Ukrainske Nacionalisti, one time and never in connection with any atrocity or any pogrom. Eyewitness accounts, a thousand page book written by Martin Gilbert. He collected numerous testimony. Also, coming up short of any indictment or even accusation against the OUN. In fact, interestingly enough, Raoul Hilberg relied on German documents primarily. And he, to a large degree, he poo-pooed eyewitness testimony, but he relied on German documents, and in one of his documents, he specifically says how the Germans bemoaned the fact that Ukrainians were not cooperative, that Ukrainians were not doing their part in the extermination of Jews. This is coming from, with all due respect, Professor, a scholar on the Holocaust who is more established and more renowned than you. Yet, you quote Hilbert in your paper one time only in defining what a pogrom is. All right? That's it. And yet, you contort that definition. Because pogroms, according to Raoul Hilbert, are an action, sporadic action, that is done by the spinota, by the society where the local population is found. 
Here you're suggesting that the view pogrom was perpetrated essentially by people who were coming from Kharkov. Kharkov, yes, because the Otwin leadership was coming from from Krakow, rather. Krakow. Krakow. Sorry, Kharkov is a Russian version of Kharkiv, right? Krakow. That's where they were coming from. All right? And then they used, apparently, the local personnel. Yet, that's not a pogrom. In any event, no one supports that version of the facts. Neither Raoul Hilbert, neither Martin Gilbert, neither the Special Soviet Commission, even Procurator Rudenko doesn't, didn't agree with you. 